Ah, no será así, ¿no? Yeah. <laughs> Buenos días. Eh. Good morning and welcome to this conversation with Gastón Acurio in the World Economic Forum in Lima, Peru. I'm Jose Josefine, Josefina de Townsend from TV Peru. It is a true pleasure to be able to talk to Gastón Acurio, Peruvian chef that has launched our food, our cuisine, in a success, successful trip around the world. And here in the country, it is a source of, of national pride. And aside from this, with Gaston, our gastronomy cuisine has more presence in this struggle to have a society that becomes, a, or a fairer society. Thank you very much for being here. Gaston, a moment ago, you mentioned that your first restaurant, Astrid and Gaston, was founded in 1994 and opened, it opened its doors on July 14th. And you say that it was not on purpose, but it seemed to be because of the type of food and dishes that you offered. When in your, in your dishes you had oyuco, quinoa, you prepared causas, tiraditos, and, and you started using guinea pigs or cuis. So when did you start involving small producers and making, turning this possibility of, of making our cuisine an opportunity to be a better country and to overcome poverty. Well, thank you. Indeed, on July, well, July 14th, which seemed to be a strategy or something that I did de deliberately by trying to open, inaugurate a restaurant on the day of France in, in Lima, Peru, which is absolutely absurd, but at that time, there were the canons of aesthetics, beauty, of what is valuable, not only in Peru, but also in Latin America, in the United States, in Germany. So this explained a uh, French style, the, the hegemonic structure of the French style that has reached its end, as many other things in this change or this end of the era of the Industrial Revolution where everything has to be beautiful so that it can look beautiful, and to shift to this new era where everything has to be different in order for it to look beautiful. That's where beauty lies, in differences, and that's why small breweries appeared, uh, boutique hotels, etc., etc. So in this world where what is beautiful is what is different, Peru suddenly emerges, Peru appears. And that's why sometimes I say that the hour of Latin America has still not arrived. It has come back, it has returned. We have to understand the historical process to reach this point and understand why cuisine is part of this process. And that will lead us to a Latin America that is once again in, 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 the, in, in the middle of, of everything, if, for example, in Peru of today, in the taxi, the police, people, because of their culture, this is a recent recovery. It's an emotional emancipation. Yes, it's recent. Because for 6,500 years, this was normal. Many interesting and good things were done, creative, innovative things. Over 70% of what we eat in the world, things that our engineers back then designed and turned into products. That were then that then became universal potatoes, tomatoes, uh, bell peppers, chocolate, peanuts, and our architects also developed a spectacular architecture of ultra state of the art, ultra modern. But Machu Picchu is still there. It's still as beautiful as it was, as logical and coherent as it was. Then we had very bad 500 years in economic, social, cultural terms because it's a colony and fundamentally an emotional colonization with the Republic. We had, in, we had independence, political independence, but our mindset was incapable of releasing itself from colonization. And that's why I say that the hour of Latin America, the time of Latin America has returned. And that's how we somehow understand this as chefs. And where we have two fundamental ingredients that have to be part of, I think, any company that wants to z sell, exist, or create, which which is creativity with a commitment, creativity that meets the people's need for differences, 
to, the, to include new things. And the commitment is that people are no longer purchasing products because they like them, but because they know where they come from, how they benefit society, how they're produced, etc. So in this sense, in cuisine, we've developed a strategy that started at that point, indeed, as a, a trip of Peruvian cuisine around the world that seems to be long and important, but that is actually just starting and that today has led us to start a new phase that implies a very complex uh, phase and series of levels of tiers that go into all the different levels of, of gastronomy to be able to, as soon as possible, reach the market value that Italian cuisine has, which is $400 million. Peruvian is still at 10, 15 million, so we still have a long way to go, but but we trust that the youngsters that are now involved in, in Peruvian cuisine are going to write that history. Now, in that commitment that you have to go beyond your kitchen, how has this also marked you by the fact that you are the son of a politician? You said that in your family there was not much interest for cuisine, but there was a lot of interest for politics. Your father was a member of a political party. How did that shape the way in which you see Peru? Well, in two senses, in the good sense of undertaking a commitment in whatever activity you fulfill with your country, with your society, in a political sense, to change what is wrong for what is right. And then in the other sense, to try to not be like a politician in the sense of just forming a seat and talk without doing anything, but rather move on to action. What you do and how you actually build a surrounding of mutual trust in the activity in which you're participating so that from that you can generate important changes. In fact, I'm part of a movement. I'm part of a gastronomic movement that has a strategy to reach very clear objectives. The first one is for our gastronomy to serve as a promotion of our culture towards the world, the presence of Peru towards the world, the universal world. That's what it means for the country. The second is the promotion of what Peru produces in terms of gastronomy towards the world to generate new markets. And so that history that we at some point turned universal products that we create here, potatoes, maize, etc., can be repeated through new products that are part of our production in every sense. The third objective is for most people around the world to come to Peru to visit Peru. Tourism, promote tourism, and in that sense, gastronomy can contribute and become a part of that by opening restaurants, participating in forums, etc. And the final objective that we live on a daily basis and that we mentioned at the beginning is that cuisine has to be an instrument for integ integration of Peruvians to strengthen our, our our self-esteem, our identity, our culture, and to generate opportunities for people that don't have opportunities in a country where there's an urgent need for opportunities, but there are also many opportunities. So how does cuisine turn into a tool for that? We've been able to complete a first phase, which is promotion. That is, the world knows us. Peruvian cuisine emerges in this diverse world. It's integrated to this area, era of connectivity. Then Peru rises with great force through its biodiversity as a magical space, as a great boutique with a lot of history, ingredients, products, and the multicultural Peru that em embraced throughout its history in the last 500 years, all the cultures of the world, and turned into something new, a Peruvian-Japanese space, Peruvian-Spanish, Peruvian-Japanese. So through these forces, we've been able to place ourselves in the imaginarium of the world. People want to try, want to taste. For example, there could be a very good Peruvian restaurant in Sweden and Norway, and it would be successful if it's good. And that's why it's important to start the second phase, which is creativity with commitment and excellence, as you've mentioned. Yes, of course, but also reviewing everything. Because if someday we want to have a restaurant like Italy and Ecuador, which is a world of fantasy, of hams and cheeses and pizzerias and Italian bistros, 
For that, we have to have the entire gastronomic industry at that same level of quality and excellence. The industries, cheese industry of Peru, vegetables, boutique potatoes, concepts, restaurant concepts. So if we have a 360-degree vision, we have to actively participate. We have to participate with, with chefs, with authorities, with producers, with consumers with guests, developing that second phase of the strategy, which is what we are now doing today. If you want, we can very quickly go over some things that we're doing in agriculture and fisheries. It's part of a movement, and that movement has a fundamental activist, which is Astrid, with, that works with great enthusiasm. In the case of your work and your mission with with cocoa producers that used to produce uh, coke, it, and it was incredible that they could leave such a profitable uh, crop but also very violent, conflictive for cocoa. Yes, cocoa is an emblematic example of what this means and how we link, how we connect these small farmers of Peru and this great biodiversity with this world that needs niches, special, different, unique things, magical things. And all of a sudden, cocoa, in, in Peru we discovered that we had native cocoa in, in a world that that is seeking variety and so the different markets start purchasing from from Peru. However, it's not enough because all cocoa producers are poor while chocolate producers are rich. So what we have to do is have the, the ch their children, their offspring, be sure that they can have a Peruvian chocolate factory in Peru and not in Paris. So how do we do that with creativity, with commitment, etc.? But this can be applied to everything. The first thing we have to do is be have trust and, and rely. We have to develop links, bonds. For example, setting ourselves aside from uh, violent, extreme structures and where society will no longer look at farmers at a different level top bottom but at the same level in this way generate trade this is what we started doing we started warning the producers bringing them to the city I remember something that was very very significant and interesting when a potato producer took a bus and and saw us that we were all applauding him and he he said, you know, I'm so grateful. I've been waiting for this for 500 years. This is a matter of respect, of dignity. And from there, we have to build and develop several actions so that native potatoes can be in Switzerland, so that they can become gourmet products and niche markets. But we have to start by developing this trust. Now, for example, we have new restaurants, uh, Civichidias. We have these specialty restaurants, for example, uh, Sibas, uh, Cevicheria of Juan Perez, that was that was caught yesterday at such beach. These should be the standards in each Cevicheria in Peru, and they have this wide range that joins many groups. For example, the fishermen, the impoverished fishermen, with the specialty market. For example, they can say, "I sell." to this restaurant that operates under environmentally friendly standards. So the farmer or the producer or the fisherman is, is gaining a profit. Peru, through this magical market, and the entrepreneur, as well as the environment, because they've all agreed that they have to fish, for example, sustainably, certain sizes, etc. So these standards in fishing that will be, that will be rolled out to other other products, other sectors. This is all part of this new phase. And how are we going to do this? So this contradiction between children that suffer malnutrition in this country of gastronomic marvels, how do we keep that or avoid that from weakening our message? Today in Peru, two million children are having their breakfast with products from their own environment, with recipes from their own environment produced by farmers of their own environment. And you said that so you, you send uh, tuna cans to these communities also. Yes, and hopefully we'll start sending many other things. So this is an authentic revolution, very difficult to implement, as I'm sure you'll understand. 
and it is a symbol of admiration. I've been in Sweden. They want to come to replicate the model because they consider it's revolutionary. And above all, very coherent in a country such as Peru that has great biodiversity, and it makes sense to take advantage of their potential, not only for financial or economic reasons, but to also assist in, in the development of self-esteem, for example, of the population of the children that are used to hearing that everything that they have is, is ugly. And also we're doing more magical, poetic things. We are, we are growing gardens, vegetable gardens in, in schools so that the children can learn how to, how to love their, their products, their land, and then so that they can understand how that can then be turned into industrial product. And then, for example, a recovery of dignity of traditions. And then they sit around the table to share, to talk. So we adopt a school so that the private enterprise, private company, can actively participate in the education of our future youngsters, the future population. In field of innovation, we are working very hard to develop new business models, new concepts that will allow thousands of, of youngsters to free themselves from the slavery of, of uh, for example, thinking that they need a four million dollar uh, cuisine or a kitchen and that they'll never be able to have that. But now we have examples of chefs that ha that are working that have started with a five thousand dollar investment. So it's important to make them understand that. Unfortunately, today the world is deliciously crazy or insane. In the past, economy was reserved for somebody that can pay for it. Today, you simply press a button, and you can exactly know. Uh, for example, you can live in a very in a very humble, a very impoverished zone, and you can know what is going on around the world. So by having access to that information, what has happened? that the people eat the food of the best restaurant in New York, for example, in a food truck. In your mind, you can eat it there because you understand it, and you eat it happily because the chef that worked at that restaurant didn't have money. He opened a food truck and started working. And also for recycled, yes, that's part of the business model that we're trying to promote so that youngsters can have access to this, but with innovation, with creativity, with design. Design is a fundamental tool. For example, in Japan, an apple costs fifty dollars, not because of the apple, but because of the of the wrapping of the box. So we have to include design in in our entire lives, and it has to be a fundamental tool in industry. For example, I developed a sauce that has taken me two years to just have one ingredient. When I could have included twenty and saved time, but it took me two years, and the result is evident. And my dream is that it'll be the next ketchup. I don't know if if I'll succeed, but the Peruvian taste, the Peruvian flavor. Does it have does it have peppers, hot peppers? Yes, it's that spicy taste, but that that sauce has new standards and it's connected to to small producers of yellow peppers. So we've worked very actively in selling our cuisine to the world. And we've worked with the public sector. For example, in Peru we've developed a state policy that sells gastronomy as a promotion tool f to reach those four objectives. So, well, you know, we can talk about this for hours. I know there are time constraints, but I've tried to share this vision that hopefully in the, in, in the next years will take us to the development of Peru in which everyone will have opportunities to build a Latin America where the balance between north and south is actually balanced, where the flows, capital flows of products, consumption products from here to there could be through a, a fair relationship and not like we see today where we're still extracting to produce, consume. So how can we have how can we reach that level in which made in Peru is equivalent to made in France or even be more valuable? There is a small area where we've achieved this. Chile, which is, uh, well, in Chile, Peruvian restaurants are the most expensive ones. You go to the wholesale market and it looks like a Peruvian invasion, but without bullets or weapons or anything. So most 
Most of them are Peruvian product stalls. So we want to design a plan for our sauces with our partner, with our very strategic partner, to reach Chile. And it, it is already in all wholesale markets through different mechanisms that, that entrepreneurs are, are managing. But that's the idea. To, but to work, work with humility, this isn't a matter of being chauvinistic or anything. It's just a matter of sharing with the world while we bring prosperity to our own society. Now, this topic of having 80,000 80, youngsters that are very enthusiastic about that, about this, I, you started a revolution of, of gender. Normally, this is, was an industry it, of women, and, and you lived in a home f full of women. How did you become interested in, in cuisine? Well, yes, we work with a group uh, called Pachacutic, where we have fantastic youngsters that, with great talent, are now working. Uh, a couple of them will probably, in the future, be the best chefs in the world. But that, this is also a response to this urgent need to to establish a chef as an intellectual being. A chef no longer can no longer sell plates, dishes, but histories, stories. So a humanistic approach in southern Lima, our, well, our friends and my friends in Europe say it's going to be the best uh, cuisine, the best school in the world because we're trying to educate intellectuals. They are going to learn anthropology, sociology, so that they can understand their surrounding biology, so that they can understand the products, ingredients, agriculture, so that they can learn how to understand the cosmovision. Uh, phys in physics, chemistry, so that they can understand processes, modern arts, music, so that they can capture beauty, rhythm, include rhythm in, in what they do, in, in everything that is necessary, so that this person can be educated and then cook, but cook stories, seductive, provocative stories that can generate change. Not from a political stance or discourse that seeks to go out on the streets and and have public demonstrations. No, but we have to undertake a role that is much more important, much more beautiful, in which cuisine is not only seen as as a pure activity of of fun or leisure, but as education. Yeah, and I remember that you even you told you asked your godfather to to give you a a Chinese food restaurant for your birthday. Well, yeah, I was I was a strange kid, a weird kid. I wasn't into football and into soccer or anything. I was I was deranged. But you you actually wanted him to give you a restaurant, and he said, "Yeah, what do you what do you want? What do you want for your birthday?" And I said, "Well, I want a chief. I want a Chinese food restaurant. That's what I want for my birthday." Do you think that this phenomenon, this this peaceful revolution that has started in Peru and in Latin America through cuisine can be replicated in our country with other manifestations of culture, music? Well, I think that everything that I've mentioned can be replicated in any activity. It, it's just the act of participation of an entire productive chain, regardless of what it is, understanding that we have to develop it together in order to reach different goals. Uh, for example, different from the case of Peru. If we think that, if, or if we believe that the world ends in Peru, we're, well, we're dead. But if we look at the world as our home, we have infinite opportunities. But that's not possible if we don't have that sense of, of, of trust, of unity. Do you think you've achieved that? Well, in the kitchen, we're constantly trying to tear down these barriers of, of, distrust and out in the field, etc., and with the government, the private sector, this sense of vanity, ego between among chefs, you know, I'm better than you are. But no, we, we try to approach it from a different from a different point of view. We try to share and, and make this industry that has just started, make it grow. We have very significant figures if we assess Japanese, Chinese, Italian cuisine as global products, including 
the fact that today we have different brands in the markets and supermarkets of Italian uh, bakery products. But and if we add this Peruvian industry, we see that we have a long way to go. We hope that it's shorter than for the Italian cuisine that was a hundred that took a hundred years. The Japanese also. The world started integrating and it started taking off in the nineties. It rapidly became global in the nineties. But of course yes it is a good example. Because, for example, in the 70s, if somebody said, you know, I want you to invest in my Japanese restaurant because someday the children are going to eat raw fish or wasabi or algaes, you'd say, this guy's crazy. But today, children eat sushi. It's a global product. That's an emblematic example to understand that if we have the most important thing, which is great biodiversity, a great culture, uh, a unified gastronomic movement, we should at least reach the presence, the value, recognition that that global other global cuisines have and also overcome international crisis. Well, yes, the most important ingredient that we have today in Peru is optimism and, and the will. The great patrimony that we have today is that our youngsters, for example, and most of them don't want to work for the state. They don't want to belong to a political ideology of any kind whatsoever. They want to make their dreams come true. They want to work for themselves. So how can we release all that energy? How can we generate a new legal system or framework that can allow those youngsters to turn that dream into a reality? That's the great challenge. Youngsters that have not grown with violence or terrorism or with the hyperinflation that you had to live. Yes, we've improved it, but we do see other types of violence, social violence. For example, mothers that suffer because they can't feed their children. So these are other forms of violence. But we have to recover trust, hope. So those that have more opportunities have the responsibility of taking the first step. And something that I liked when you, is when you said that when when you play outside, you're the national team that expect to compete and to win awards. Well, yeah, we received a, an award by the, that was given to us by the French. No, excuse me, by the by the Swedish prince, and it was this big deal. So, and we received it, and then when they saw us work, they understood that we were actually representing a movement and that that award wasn't to a person it, it was to a message to efficiency it was an award for strategy with with concrete specific results to the point in which Sweden which is a country that is very far away from Peru all of a sudden distances became shorter and so we received this global award which is recognition to all that so yes we we are soldiers in our time, but instead of trying to conquer territories, we want to conquer hearts. We want to generate smiles, which is, which generate warmth, which is the, the wonderful thing of our, of our work. We're not trying to destroy others and then come back to our homes happy and feeling contented with that. No, we want to have happy customers. Our mission is to make people feel happy. And, and that's something that we have to be thankful for every day. And uh, what would be the ingredients for this revolution to reach most of the Peruvians? What would that recipe be? Well, first, uh, creativity. Constantly think about what things we can do, what new things, how to improve, etc. Commitment and irrenunciable commitment. We have to strengthen this. This commitment as a tool that must be fundamental and that can have no concessions. And third is patience. Patience, uh, because sometimes we're, we're very passionate and want to do things fast. But with these things, we can. everything is possible. Thank you very much, Gustin. Listo. Mira, has terminado justo.